So welcome to our Everything Marketplaces workshop today, which is where we're going to be kicking off a new workshop series on Marketplace SEO. So this is going to be part one of three, where we'll be covering link building in more detail. So with that said, I'm really excited to welcome on Mike Vanderheiden, who's a top mind when it comes to SEO for marketplaces. He actually uh, previously led our workshop on uh, the SEO uh, overview. So some of you might know him here, but uh, for those that don't, he, like I said, he's definitely a top mind and has uh, worked with marketplaces like Fresha, AutoGuru, Bookwell, Truckit, and many more. So right before I let uh, Mike take over, I did once again want to mention that this is going to be the same format as our other workshops. So it's going to be about a 20 to 25 minute presentation followed by a group Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can just uh, post them in the chat and uh, use the uh, Zoom raise him functionality so that way we know to uh, call on you during the group Q&A. So with that said, you know, thanks for uh, joining us here today, Mike, uh, once again. And I'm uh, really excited to uh, have you to kind of uh, kick this uh, new workshop series off with us. So I'll uh, just let you uh, start with a brief intro and uh, take it over from here. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Uh, oh, as always, happy to be here. Um, so today we're going to dive into a topic that I'll probably get most questions about um, is, is link building, right? We all know it's sort of important, um, but a little bit of a background about myself. So I've been doing this uh, SEO game for about 17 years now. Um, did built two of Australia's sort of leading marketing agencies, search agencies, um, left there and kind of felt the, the marketplace niche was where I was at, right? I was doing a lot of work with marketplaces in terms of e-com, classifieds, uh, service-based, everything else. Uh, we kind of involved from an agency to, uh, I guess, a hybrid agency slash VC or micro VC. So I've done some angel investments, uh, do some strategic advisory work. Um, and these sessions, I like to keep them uh, very actionable, right? So rather than, than going through theory and, and hypotheticals, I just go, look, this is what we're doing. This is what's working. Um, go out and, and basically do it, right? Um, and so what you'll see is today's agenda that I want to take you through is just a quick history lesson about link building and how it actually came about. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to go through some, some, some of the basics, some stuff that you can do on no budget, uh, stuff that you can get kind of, you know, get the ball rolling. We'll look at a couple of more sort of advanced tactics and then uh, a list of resources. So there might be some tools that I mentioned or some readings that I mentioned, and I'll just list those in the resources. So uh, at the right time, you can still sort of, uh, have a read through. So a quick history lesson. So uh, the internet's obviously been around for a, a little while now, um, and, and Google would around for you know, a big part of that. And they were indexing a lot of web content, right? And and obviously what they're trying to do is they're trying to rank you know, which one is going to be number one, number two, which ones are the most relevant. And so the very first sort of quote unquote algorithm that they that they had to sort this out was called PageRank. So PageRank was really just Google's way of determining look, where do we basically rank a web page based on the number of links pointing to that page. Um, and so early on, whether you call them SEOs or webmasters, um, it was, uh, they even released a Google toolbar, by the way, that would show a little green bar that said, oh, you know, you're a page rank one to 10, and Google was obviously a 10, and everyone else wasn't. Um, and really, you know, the higher the page rank, the higher the, the value of that particular page or website, right? And you can see here, that's kind of how the link building works, right? Links, uh, site pointing from A to B, B to C, B to F, B to D, et cetera. It's kind of like a big network. Um, so essentially, yeah, Google interprets a link from page A to page B as a vote from page A to page B. So I link to everything marketplaces. That's my website voting for everything marketplaces. Um, and the more links that everything marketplaces would get, the more valuable a link from everything marketplaces would be. Um, and as SEOs, uh, we, we saw that and we ruined it, right? Because we said, well, if that's the only metric, what we'll do is we'll just build a ton of links because that's going to get us to the top of the search results, right? So um, this is kind of where link building was born. Um, link building being the practice of basically building one-way hyperlinks, or quote unquote backlinks, to a website with the goal of increasing its search engine visibility because, hey, we've now figured out that more links, better rankings, better rankings, more traffic, more traffic, more dollars, right? It was pretty simple. So what we would do is we would storm these directories like the Yahoo, the Demos directory, and we'd drop our links there. 
we would spam the hell out of blogs and forums and drop our links in every which way that we could find because it was all about the number of links. And for a while, that was, uh, you know, those were the golden days. But as you'll know, Google got a little bit smarter. So um, they released this fellow here, uh, famously known as Google Penguin. Uh, it was an algorithm update released by Google in April 2012 which basically targeted websites that had essentially all done spammy and irrelevant link building. So it looked at sites that were just getting links from forums, from blogs, um, totally irrelevant links. And that algorithm would kind of be refined over the following years, right? So released in 2012, it had iterations all the way through 2016, where the Google 4.0 or Penguin 4.0 uh, final announcement was made and that was right before Google kind of integrated it into their main algorithm. So now there is no specific sort of algorithm announcements around link building and stuff anymore. It's just become part of what Google is now and it's become a, a significant, still is a significant ranking factor. So things shifted from, from building quantity of links and getting a whole ton of them to, okay, well, let's look at what actually makes a good link and, and what is a quality link. So um, things that we ask ourselves now is not how many links can I get within a month, which is, uh, which is unfortunately still the case for some agencies, but we really look at what's the authority of the page sending the link and the relevance of the page, right? If I'm working with marketplace founders, a link from everything marketplaces, for example, is going to be much more valuable than a link from, you know, my best made shoe polishing business. It's got no context, no relevance. It looks at where is the link on the page. Um, so you would have seen in the early days, you'd have a nice uh, a website or a homepage, and then there were just this big block or wall of links down the bottom, right? And so Google clearly, um, was able to identify that, hey, uh, that's not right. Uh, it doesn't look natural. Um, and what we now look at is, what is a sort of a natural link placement? So when you read the news, CNN, whatever, when they reference one of their author articles or they reference a name or an author, they will typically link out to that author's you know, book page or whatever it might be. And that's obviously super relevant. It's super natural um, and it's editorial placed. It's not spammy. Um, and the other things that we typically tend to look out for now are sort of things called private blog networks, which is uh, a lot of agencies have basically built uh, you know, 100 different domains. And, and the only reason they've built those websites or domains is to just link out to their clients, right? Google can see all of that. Google is a domain registrar, so it actually knows who's registered the domain. So it's a pretty clear footprint, right? Um, and then you can get into all sorts of other things like sponsored posts. So if you're going and paying someone to actually write something about your business, that's a sponsored post. And Google will actually now tell you, hey, that needs to be labeled. Otherwise, it's unnatural. So keeping all of that in mind, and, and you know, you're going to come back to this a couple of times. The question really is, um, with all of that in, 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 the, in the background, what is actually working, right? And so... Like I said before, what we want to do is sort of dive into two sections, one that you can get started with right now for the early stages. And then once you've got a little bit more budget uh, and more scalable tactics that we can look at. But the first thing that you want to start off with is uh, your toolkit, right? So really basics, um, Google, um, Gmail, or any, any other sort of uh, email marketing software. And that's meant to say Mailshake. Uh, Mailshake allows you to send an email and actually set three or four follow-ups in the same email, right? So you don't have to come back to it and think about all the emails that you send. Um, Google Sheets, just a, or an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of what you've done. Um, I would do definitely highly recommend a subscription to Ahrefs. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. It's just a super handy tool. Um, and then what I personally use is, is hunter.io. Um, it allows you to basically type in an email, or, sorry, a website address, uh, and it will find you any emails associated with that domain. So a good way to find, you know, journalist email addresses. Um, so the first thing that I would do is basically listen to your industry, right? And your competitors. 
So, um, you know, if you want to be a bit of an, uh, if you've got a bit of an ego, you can probably set a Google alert for your own name. Um, but what we typically do is when we work with a client, we set some alerts for basically their domain, um, their business name, their competitors. Um, and, and we look at, you know, who are some of the journalists or editors or writers that regularly publish about the industry, right? So a, a neat little tool, Google Alerts. Um, I've basically got quote unquote, you know, online marketplaces, quote unquote, Mike Vanderheiden, quote unquote, everything marketplaces. And every week I get a bit of a summary of, hey, this is where uh, these things have come up in a Google search. So a really good way to kind of see what your competitors are doing, where they're being mentioned and starting to learn a little bit more about the landscape. The second thing is, again, um, most of you will already have some sort of competition in the market. Um, very rarely are there none, but nonetheless, you can look at what, what are your closest competitors, right? And let's reverse engineer them. And that's where a tool like Ahrefs comes in really handy. They've got a, a thing called the Backlinks Report. Um, and as you can see here, we did one for Flipper and we just looked at, okay, um, what are the backlinks that they have and where are opportunities for us to actually reach out to those publications or to those links um, and say, hey, we can actually add a little bit of value here, right? So for example, um, they had a link from BigCommerce, which basically links back to affiliate marketing on their side. It's very high authority domain, not likely to get that. We'll skip over that. Um, Manhattan, it's a link from Wikipedia. And basically what they had was a, a, a UpperEast.com, which was a drop domain, and they've redirected that to a sales page on Flipper. Um, but as you can see, there's, you know, 119,000 odd links. You can start going through and seeing, okay, well, what are they doing? What, what is my competition doing? Are they producing um, opinions? Are they giving reference materials? Are they producing listicles and being referenced, right? So it's a great way to sort of, you know, find five or 10 good opportunities every month to just chase and see if you can add value, right? The next thing is um, being a useful resource, right? So especially if you've got a new marketplace, um, you're probably in an industry, like for example, we did this with, with a pet sitting marketplace, similar to, I believe in the US, there's, there's WAG. Um, and what we said was, well, we've got no link building um, strategies yet. We, we don't have anything. We don't have a content marketing strategy, but we know that we can add a lot of useful information because we know the industry well, to people that are publishing about pets. So we would put in keywords like, you know, dog sitting plus useful resources and, you know, care.com, for example, being a, a, a Goliath that it is, it's got the ultimate dog sitters checklist. Um, so we would read that article and say, well, actually you're missing point A or B. And we would reach out to the journalist and say, hey, or to the editor and say, hey, you've missed out these points. We would love to provide you a reference or, you know, what to look for in your next dog sitter. Um, hey, we've actually come across this in our community. You should add that to there and, and be, have an opportunity to uh, be an expert in your field, right? And add some value. Uh, obviously, no, there's no budget required for this. It's just time. And it's 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 hit and miss, right? You're not going to hit 100% of the emails that you sent. But if you're getting a 10, 20% strike rate on the emails that you sent, that's good, right? If you're spending a couple hours a month, it's it's a way to get started. Um, the next thing is, is probably the simplest one, maybe for a bit more uh, progressed marketplaces, is looking at things like broken links and link reclamation. So um, again, in a tool like Ahrefs, you can run a quick report on your own business and say, hey, um, for example, 45 ways of proven wealth building passive income ideas. Um, it's obviously a link that Flipper used to have, but it's now not found. Um, it looks like that. Uh, that article might have been redirected or it's been taken offline um, or they've just removed the link. Um, and, and I would go in and go, hey, hang on, we've already done the work for this once. Let's go back and see what's happened and let's see if we can get that link back. Um, and also you want to do this for your competitors, right? If, if someone, uh, if one of Flipper's competitors was mentioned here, like a, a micro acquire, I would go to that page and say, hey, we noticed that you used the link to micro acquire, but um, why don't you include Flipper? Because we basically do the same thing, right? And it comes back to just being smart and going, well, these people have already linked out to me, to my competitors. So they're more likely to update this resource um, if I provide some value. 
another great one, especially for the pet sitting, um, was, was local events. So depending on your industry, this may or not be relevant, but we've had great success with this, and like I said, and obviously in pets, collectors, automotive, um, and you might look at things like Meetup, um, and you just type in, you know, dogs and sponsors, and it allow you to see what Meetup events there are that allows for sponsors, right? And sponsors typically you give them a small donation, and they give you a mention, or they put your logo on there, or a link back to your website. And so we would do this for dogs, cats. And then we'd go through all the dog breeds, right? There is big markets around uh, poodles and all the crossbreeds of poodles, brutals, cavoodles, <laughs> every type of poodle that's out there. Um, and we would just approach them all and say, hey, we'll donate 100 bucks and they get a link back, right? So that's a great way to sort of uh, not only get links back, but it also looks like, you know, from the good of our hearts, we're donating to these local meetups, right? So it's kind of two birds, one stone. Um, so those are sort of more of the, the, the cheaper on a budget type stuff that really works, but it does take a little bit of time. Now, once you're a little bit more advanced, what are the things that are working, right? So um, I'm just going to blatantly self-promote here, um, but you provide your expertise and insights, right? There is tools such as um, help a reporter out, Turkle, source, bottle or quoted. And basically what these platforms do is journalists go out there and say, hey, I'm writing an article on uh, the best poodle breeds in the world, right? And we would love for you or we would love for a expert in poodles or poodle breeds to give some insights or some quotes. Um, and so the, <laughs> the text I just realized does not match this, uh, this slide, but regardless, what you then go and do is you scout through these. They'll send you a daily wrap-up email and say, okay, hey, uh, this is how I came across ShareTribe, for example, and I collaborated with ShareTribe on a bunch of articles on Marketplace SEO. Um, and there's you know, a link. Mike Van Hyden is the founder and managing partner of Portal Ventures. It's a link back to me for very little effort. Um, and in every industry, there'll be a journalist covering something in your industry, right? So sign up for them. Most of them are free up to a certain extent, maybe up to five quotes a month. Um, but, you know, if you sign up for four of those tools, that's 20 opportunities you get to sort of um, get in there, right? Now, some of the more um, advanced stuff that's working really, really well at the moment for us is, is industry stats and surveys, right? So this is an example of, of Deal Drop. They're a... Um, a coupon website, basically a discount website. And what we thought was, okay, well, it's hard to come up with something that uh, and someone's going to link to about discount coupons, right? So we looked outside the box and kind of said, okay, well, meal delivery trends, this was during, you know, start of 2022. So we thought, you know what, we're going to do a, a trends analysis and basically which meal delivery services are popular in 2022. Uh, all we really did was come up with five or 10 questions like, you know, which which was the last meal delivery service you used? Uh, on what day do you typically use them? What's your average spend uh, with one of the meal delivery services? We would then uh, run them through SurveyMonkey. Um, and basically, you can buy a thousand answers for, I think it's a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks. Um, and from the answers from that, we would extrapolate a story and basically write, well, hey, based on the research that we did, 30% um, of people that ordered on Uber Eats would spend $30, but 50% of the people that ordered on DoorDash would spend $100. And this is what they typically buy. And these were the most popular courses that they would buy. Um, and journalists would eat this up, right? Because no one is producing this sort of information. Definitely not Uber Eats or DoorDash. So it's a little bit controversial. Um, you know, you do have to put in a little effort. Like it costs a bit of money to get the survey monkey um, survey running. Um, it'll take a little bit of time to polish off the article, create some infographics. Um, but we've managed to get links from, you know, Amex, Shopify, BigCommerce, some very, very powerful domains, right? And second of all, it adds to the overall authority of your website, right? If you're publishing survey stats about your industry, naturally, journalists are going to come back and go, well, hey, these guys have produced interesting stats for me before. Uh, let's see what else they got. And you start building relationships with the uh, with the journalists. 
Um, this one is probably my favorite, right? As a founder, your job is to basically get the word out about the company. Aside from, you know, setting the, the vision and hiring the people, it's, you know, you're promoting your baby. This is your marketplace. So the best thing to do is to talk about it, right? Uh, everything marketplace is workshop, right? I talk about SEO. It's what I love doing. I'm doing it in marketplaces. Everything marketplaces is like the perfect opportunity for me to be doing this. Um, again, Share Tribe have got Share Tribe Academy. Um, I did an interview with them. Again, perfect match, right? It's an expert in my field being interviewed by experts in their field. So go out there and talk to people in your industry or people that are covering your industry and see what podcasts, what publicity, what magazines are out there. They don't need to be huge followings, but they're super, super relevant and they'll have a readership. Um, so yeah, probably my favorite, right? Um, founders are typically hesitant to spend money in the early days on link building too. But, you know, you can never get them to stop talking about their business. So it's like a, a best way to, to get traction. Um, and once you get a little bit familiar with it, you've done a few, yeah, flip the script, host the podcast and interview people. So taking that previous point that we just discussed, uh, Mike started Everything Marketplaces and it's become the powerhouse that it is because guess what? He started interviewing people. He started adding value to marketplace founders. So what you really got to think about is how can you stroke the egos of the supply side of your marketplace, right? If you've got a new marketplace, you've got some early suppliers, interview them, ask them questions, get to know them um, and publish that content, right? It's, it's really good for your supply side that you're showing an interest, but it's also good for the demand side to understand that you're actually very engaged with your supply side. So both of those things work extremely well. Um, and probably one of the ones when you're starting to get a little bit more budget um, is what we like to call barnacle link building and technically revenue building, right? So often what you'll see is um, high authority publications that will rank for terms that, you know, technically they shouldn't rank for, but they do. So uh, a perfect example being restaurants, right? I'm looking for the best restaurants in New York City. Um, I see Time Out. Time Out, I've seen that magazine before. I know what that is. That sounds like a pretty credible source, right? And you'd think these guys are just general good guys, best of the, you know, best intentions. They just want to show you the best New York restaurants. Well, guess what? Um, Gage and Tolner, um, great. What is it? Why we love it? Oh, by the way, order your delivery through Seamless. And if you read the URL here, they're in Fulton Street, Brooklyn. And then here's their little affiliate ID, right? So when you think about it, yes, they are listing the best restaurants in New York, but they're also listing the ones that will give them an affiliate click when someone orders from that restaurant through Seamless, right? So in your service or in your industry, are there any publications like this that rank where you can do a deal and say, hey, um, we'd like some coverage because we're not ranking on the front page, but you are for a term that we would like to be covered on. The next best thing um, to ranking number one is to approach the number one, number two, number three, and see how you can be included on there, right? So this works really well from a marketplace perspective, but it also works really well if you're in e-commerce, right? If you're talking about diet pills, protein powders, um, it's actually a massive revenue builder. Um, quite a few tactics there and, you know, I've gone through them pretty fast, but definitely what you shouldn't be doing is responding to emails like this. If I can give you one piece of advice, hit the spam box, don't engage. Um, everyone gets these email. Hey, I'm, I'm, I've got high quality sites and for only 50 bucks, well, blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. Um, those lists are typically public. They're typically blacklisted already because, you know, everyone's getting these emails, including Google. Um, and if you're blacklisted or, or if that domain is blacklisted and they can see that you're consistently getting links from blacklisted site, guess what? Google is going to knock on your door and say, hey, we're seeing that you're doing unnatural stuff. Um, and until you fix it, we'll just remove you from the index, right? So uh, we've seen this plenty of times. Um, and it's not a quick thing, right? You can have all the links removed, but Google will still go, yeah, look, we get a lot of this. So, you know, it might take a couple of months before we actually get to your query. 
So by building links like this, you could actually be putting your entire business up uh, yeah, on, on, on fire, basically. Uh, so don't do it, right? Um, and then a list of resources, right? So we've gone through a lot of stuff here. Um, I would not go and do anything outside of this list. I would just get started with this. There is probably 100,000 ways to build links, but I've given you some ones that are free. You can get started with right away, and it's just about focus. Um, all of these work. We still use them today. We use them with million-dollar companies, billion-dollar companies. They work, um, but it's just dedicating the time and not getting discouraged. Right. And as you progress, you'll start getting smarter and smarter with these things. So um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I think that was pretty close to sort of the 20 minute mark. And that leaves us some time for questions and um, yeah, anything that you guys might have to uh, or want to share or examples. Yeah, this is a really great. So uh, thanks for walking us through it, Mike. Um, so I actually no have a, a question for you, uh, my, you know, myself, and that's, uh, you know, I would say typically for the earlier stage kind of marketplaces that are maybe kind of like right at, uh, you know, pre or right at product market fit. Um, is this something that typically like the founders are doing, you know, themselves and trying to see like, you know, what's working and then how to, you know, create more uh, processes and kind of scale it or are that you're seeing them kind of higher or someone on the team? Could you maybe share a little bit more about like who's doing this and, you know, for, sure. for how long? So typically what we see is when, when they're pre, pre-capital or, or right at product market fit, or even before that, right, is founders are doing most of the podcasts and the publicity stuff and going, hey, um, you know, I, I want to talk to you on the podcast. Um, some of these other techniques, uh, we've got some, you've got some founders that are really hands-on and want to do this. Um, or what they get is, is kind of got a junior marketing person in that will look at their social media, post on their social media, like everyone gets a bit of a junior in and then goes, hey, let's teach him some of these tactics to basically get the ball rolling, right? But eventually what ends up happening is they either hire an SEO person in-house or they end up hiring an agency that looks after this. Um, but again, just be very mindful and ask lots of questions if you do outsource this because it can be pretty dangerous if not done right. Got it. Hey, uh, hey, Rob, do you uh, want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. This is super valuable. Um, I had kind of a one and a half parter here. Um, what one is? Uh, like, is there is there a specific reason why link building was number one on this series? Like, is this? You know, personally, I've developed a lot of content, but I think I've neglected link building a little bit, and that might be why I haven't seen the immediate return or midterm return. So looking to get into this now's a good timing and the second part is as a founder who is growing a business and getting more busy i always think of seo and this might be the incorrect way to think about it as being kind of like a either you know the basics or you can get super deep and uh i think i've been kind of thrown off by a couple like agency owners who do seem knowledgeable but it's like they're throwing way too much stuff at you at once and you're like yeah. i just like run away right so i liked how you distilled everything nice and simply and i guess for a founder what would be the advice as you grow your team as you got a couple of employees like where do you see this fit into the founder schedule um and, and maybe it depends on their yeah. personality type and, and kind of what's realistic yeah, good question. Good question. Um, so to answer your first question of why was this the first in the series, purely because of the questions that we got in previous podcasts, everyone was always, oh, webinars was always talking about link building. How do we do it? We know it's important. Um, while it is important, it's not necessary to make or break thing that you think it is, right? Uh, we've built marketplaces with no link building, but the, the big but here is they had a founder that was charismatic and could talk for hours to anyone about any topic that was even mildly related to his marketplace. So he would have a normal schedule of four or five podcasts or interviews a week, right? And he's gone, yeah, this, this link building stuff is not necessary. Look at, look at what we're doing. And I'm going, well, actually, you've been building 20, 30 solid links a month, right? <laughs> That's someone's entire budget. Um and so, which kind of then translates into your second question, if you're building an early stage marketplace, hiring an agency like a, a typical one of the big agencies that you might come across, they're typically more geared towards maybe e-commerce or maybe small business. And what they're doing is trying to apply that same um, playbook to a marketplace. 
right? So they might go, well, we've got a website with a thousand pages. Uh, it might be a law firm and they'll approach the law firm the same way they approach your marketplace. When in actual fact, when you distill the marketplace down, it's not the same, right? You're dealing with scale and you're dealing with typically four templates, homepage, search results, property or product display page, and a blog. So if you know how to pull the levers on four templates, you can get far much more done than an agency would um, yeah, optimizing a law firm website. Hey, Mike, uh, I think it might be great uh, if you can uh, may maybe go into a little bit of detail about, you know, uh, as a marketplace specifically, you know, differentiating it from, say, like e-commerce or another business type, how you can kind of focus on supply. And when, you know, doing a lot of these initiatives, when it comes to like creating, you know, content um, and helping kind of showcase and feature supply through content and uh, link building, how that can actually, you know, overall benefit the marketplace and maybe how founders are thinking about how they spend their time, you know. Yeah, I, th I always think the biggest thing for a founder and, and you know, CEO, founder, whatever you want to call yourself, is sharing the vision of your business, right? So you've got to be super passionate about what you're doing and you've got to be super passionate about explaining that to people, right? So um, an SEO might come and look at this presentation and go, oh my God, this is like the most basic stuff ever, right? But I know my audience isn't necessarily, S it's, it's not SEOs. My, my audience is early stage marketplace founders and giving them the basics to get started, right? So when you're talking about the supply side, what I would do is every supplier that I would onboard on my marketplace, I would interview publicly, put a podcast together and say, hey, we're going to showcase, you know, Mike from Everything Marketplaces today. We're going to, um, you know, show John from this business today. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about this business and let them share their business because there is no greater um, way to kind of make content than by getting people to talk about their business and why their business is the way that it is, what differentiates them. Um, it's a bit of an ego boost and it gives you free content. It's, um, if you want to really put it uh, into perspective, Joe Rogan is kind of an expert of nothing, but knowledgeable about everything. And the only reason is that he invites people with different perspectives and the questions that he asks are very insightful. And so people see him as this, you know, um, expert on, on, on fitness, expert on conspiracy theories, on uh, the CIA and, and all this other stuff. When in actual fact, all he does is just interview people and allow into and, and allow people to talk passionately about what drives them and what their vision is, um, and that's a great way to start a marketplace. Yeah, certainly. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, I, I think it's just like a kind of. Uh, thinking about, you know, what do we have that's kind of unique to us as marketplaces, especially being like a very kind of niche or vertical marketplace, which is like, hey, we have these suppliers um, that are very unique and we can, you know, showcase them to in turn kind of build our thought leadership, you know, within the space and brand out as a marketplace also while, while creating a great content for, uh, for, for link building. So yeah, hundred percent. Cool. Hey, uh, hey, Brian, do you uh, want to come on? Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Mike. <laughs> thanks to both of you guys for having us. Um, my question was also really around timing. Um, so first, Davey, we're experiencing the same thing, by the way, on like our sitemap and they're getting crawled, but the indexing takes months. So I, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. It just takes time. Um, but what we're talking about here with the backlinks, um, the, so the links and maybe the traffic from the links are important, but really what's important is just that increasing domain authority, right? That's what we're yeah. trying to do on that. How long do you typically see that cycle taking? So in other words, you get links, you get backlinks starting to build. Then, you know, as Google sees that, your domain authority starts to rise. And then as your domain authority rises, you get higher placement on search. Like, I know so, SEO is a, a long game, but like, what, what are correct. we looking at typically? So, so we're now talking about a couple of different angles, right? We're talking about link acquisition for the purposes of increasing domain authority, which domain authority is is partly content, partly links. Um, and if you just did a straight up and building com uh, campaign, the first you know, top, if you want to get it on a scale of 100, typically, you know, getting to the first 20 through that first stage is kind of the harder part. But then we've taken them from domain authority. And it's a useless metric, but it's all we've got really, right? But we've taken it from 20 to 50 within three to six months. That can go really fast. The interesting correlation is 
we've had a marketplace here in Australia um, that we worked with and their um, domain authority was sort of in the mid thirties, right? This business got acquired by uh, a business overseas, a much larger player who had no marketplace, but was the, the, the SaaS component. Um, they had a domain authority of 80, right? And what we found is as we rolled out marketplaces on their domain, the typical time to rank and rank well from that domain authority 80 website was typically yeah, less than a week. Whereas in the business that they acquired, it would take us you know, a couple of months to see the results. So the correlation, and it's totally anecdotal, like this is not a massive study I've run, but it's happened enough times for me to go, hey, it makes sense. It's the higher your domain authority is, if you're then releasing a marketplace in new pages, those pages will have more value and are easily ranked than if you had a lower domain authority. But, but what I'm not saying is go out there and try and get the highest domain authority like in the next six months. It's 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 a gradual thing, but the correlation is there that you rank faster the more authority you have over time. Thanks. No problems. Awesome. Hey, uh, Simi, do you want to come on? Yeah, thanks, Mike. And thanks, Mike, both the mics. Uh, so Mike, I have a question. I'm building a classified marketplace for a corporate employee. Think about a Craigslist for a corporate employees. So I have a quest, two questions. First question is, so the entire marketplace that we have, it's a closed marketplace. So user cannot see the listings until they signed up or until yeah. they are signed in, right? Then what do you suggest for those kind of marketplace which are purposefully built to be a closed marketplace uh, due to the trust and how to approach it, the SEO for those? Because like most of these links are not external because we don't want those actual listing to be showcased outside except the uh, the content that we are planning to create yeah look i think uh, because we're this is more sort towards link building i think it's probably a question for one of the other webinars um, sure. but what i would say is is just look at what data you can disclose so if you're looking at car parts um what would the most sold i don't know tires in 2022 um Got use it. that and produce like a survey or a stat and go okay we've interviewed all of our suppliers and these are their most popular products. You don't need to disclose who they are, but then you've still got some resources that you can turn into an article and then reach out to, you know, the automotive journalists that are out there or the automotive publications and say, hey, look, this is what we found from our supply side of, and, and they have more than a million parts. These are the top ranges that we're selling in 2022. Got it. So that's good. Uh, thanks for that input. I have one second question I have is like, so I, so my users or like both sides are going to come from which are corporate employees, right? Now there are certain things which I can do personally, which is like for, I have, I'm also mentored to more than 500 plus software engineers, right? So what do you suggest? Like if I need to, I, I see a lot of uh, founders also in their own site on their own website, they also also publish a content more about oh what is their journey about this building this marketplace or what is the their journey about building this company or few more things like so i was always thinking about it will always uh, muddy the water when it comes to the seo because like google will get confused is it the marketplace or it is something some story so what is your suggestion around that let's say if i wanted to build some kind of content which can help this corporate employee but it's not related to marketplace should I continue to publish on the the marketplace site, or should I publish it somewhere else? If you're talking about you're, you're talking about your interviewing your supply side. Uh no. So what I was I'm talking about is like so. Let's say there are certain. You want to promote yourself as as the journey of your marketplace. Exactly. Hundred percent podcast interviews. Um, share the story on your own side by any means, um, but the concept of sharing your story is not so much SEO value as it is sharing your story with your audience. So you need Got to find it. out where your audience is and put that message in front of the audience, which is podcast, uh, editorial stuff, interviews, and as a byproduct, you'll get the backlinks. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Yes. Two pretty good questions. Hey, uh, Simi, to kind of circle back on your first question, which is about like kind of like a closed marketplace or maybe some like managed marketplace that don't have like public listings and URLs. Um, you know, one kind of thought that comes to mind on that is, you know, maybe even like 
highlighting past kind of success um, stories of, of sales that you can then show um, and saying like, hey, here's the top five items sold, you know, based off of these kind of like demographics of maybe some of your users or, or uh, you know, location or whatnot. And uh, okay. you can tie that content into backlinking too. So Case studies, cool. perfect, perfect example, Mark. Um, case study, it's how I built all the ventures, right? It was no nothing. And all I did was just share case studies. Um, perfect. Yeah, perfect way. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. With the mics. Awesome. So we're almost out of time here. Uh, if anyone else had a question, uh, feel free to jump on. The last uh, kind of few. I minutes got a quick here. one, actually, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned the local events in the presentation, and I think you were mentioning like Eventbrite, Meetup.com, that kind of thing. Is the intention that the link would live on Eventbrite or Meetup.com if you were to sponsor the event, or is it like something else? Uh, both, right? Sometimes they can have a link there. Um, what we did with uh, local events was we sponsor in Australia, it's called the YPCA, uh, which is like your local vet, uh, like they adopt dogs and all that sort of stuff. So what we would do is we would select like 20 or 30 of them around Australia and we would just donate 500 bucks at the end of the year to, to get dog food that sort of stuff for Christmas. Um, and we'd get listed as one of their sponsors. So that was 500 bucks for a super relevant links, right? It's a one-time investment. Um, so you, you can start the relationship there or you can get the link from me. And, and is it uh, just, you, maybe you mentioned this, but it, you know, the actual landing page from your site that it's linked back, does that really matter at the end of the day? If it's like a, a blog post or your homepage, is there any difference in rank? Look, in ideally, value? you know, you want to you get it to category pages, but it's super hard. No one's going to link to commercial landing pages. So what we tend up doing is if they link back to a blog post and you get a lot of links to that blog post, you just want to make sure that somewhere in that blog post, you internally link it back to some of the category pages that you're trying to rank for. So you've got a trickle down effect, right? Link comes in at the top, hits a blog, and then it's got a couple of links that it will spread out to. So that value will get spread out through the links in that content. So gotcha. you always want to make sure that you, the high value blogs, you link them to some of the pages that you really want to rank for. Um, and that's how you can kind of, I hate to use the word and I'll get a lot of flack for it in like SEO terms, but it kind of, you can sculpt it a little bit. And, and last one, uh, what's your take on kind of the value of Reddit links? Does it depend on what subreddit those links are in or, you know? No, they're awesome. I, lo I love Reddit, Quora. Um, it's good for starting, right? It's it's building your reputation. Um, and actually, sales get generated from Quora and Reddit. Right? I know gotcha. plenty of marketplaces, e-commerce stores, where Reddit is is like top five sales channel. Amazing. And is Quora, sorry, I'm, I'm stealing the airways, but is Quora uh, still a popular site? Like, is it kind of yeah. losing steam or is it still got a lot of users? Still super relevant. Very super. Okay. It's, it's basically people searching for questions, right? Right. Um, so Reddit, Quora, they still come up when you're do, doing very, very specific searches. Um, and, and another way to do it is you can actually advertise on certain sub Quora forums, subreddits, and you can actually just pay to advertise to the people that are asking those questions. If you're solving them, it's a perfect way for a cheap customer acquisition. Great, thank you. Awesome. Those are pretty good questions. Hey, Mike, I actually had a question for you and we'll just kind of wrap up with this. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, when you when you create like event listings, say, for instance, on like a like an event, right? Um, does that uh, I know you can get direct traffic if you, you know, if you share that link yourself. But um, how quickly are those event listings kind of ranking, you know, from from there and potentially? Typically pretty fast, right? Um, you got to think about some of the big sort of, you know, you look at SeatGeek, for example, the fact that they have to rank pretty quickly for events is important to them. So they've got in, a lot of internal teams that make sure that those events rank. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, everything marketplaces, when someone types that in and you've got events, um, you want to have Meetup, um, OfferUp, oh, sorry, not OfferUp, uh, Eventbrite, all those other ones. Um, you might host them on three or four different sites. So you own the top four spots. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I was actually asking because I know we had our uh, LA meetup and I was just uh, kind of self-promotion for a second here myself too. But, um, you know, sharing a little bit of insights on that. We used uh, Luma. So we had like a Luma landing page for our event listing. Um, but we got almost like, uh, they have like lightweight analytics on that and I was tracking it and we got them uh, over 3,000 uh, 3, views on that. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay, well done. So Cool. So we are out of time here, but this is a really great workshop. So uh, thanks for taking the time to lead us here, Mike, and everyone for the uh, great questions. 
Um, so, you know, if, uh, I'll, I'll post a, a recap here in the uh, community and share the recording. So if you have any questions, we can kind of continue it in a, uh, in a thread there. And then uh, what well, we have a uh, part two out of three, uh, I believe next week uh, coming up here, Mike, and that's going to be on, uh, I believe we have, what is that, uh, content strategies? So I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Content strategy next week. Awesome. Well, definitely looking forward to it. And uh, thanks again for such a great, uh, you know, first workshop kicking off this uh, series. And, uh, you know, thanks everyone for joining in today. No problems. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, if you got any more questions, like post them in the community and I'll uh, try my best to get to them as quickly as possible.